I am an absolute sucker for retro futurism, post apocalypses, and beautiful VHS cover art. DEFCON 4 manages to deftly combine all three, so of course I couldn't resist reviewing it. I'm going to be straight with you here. This movie isn't good. It is, as we will see, actually pretty stupid. But if, like me, you were predisposed to liking the above three things, I think you'll really dig this. So don't turn the video off quite yet, because DEFCON 4 is at least entertaining. Usually, in a film review, I'd start by outlining the plot and cast of characters. But seeing as this doesn't really have either of those, I'm going to start with the cover art this week. There were from there. Not because it is absolutely beautiful and eye-catching in a way that no human would ever be able to walk past it on a Friday night in Blockbuster. No, that goes without saying, you have all got eyes. What I need to talk about is the fact that all of this, all of this is lies. It's just pure dirty lies. Now I've discussed previously on this channel how VHS box art often had at best a tenuous grip on reality, but would often virtually have no relation to the actual film it was purporting to advertise. This box art is possibly the most egregious example of that I've ever seen. So let's start with the title. DEFCON 4, or Defense Condition 4, refers to the alert readiness system that the US military uses. This movie takes place just before during and then after a nuclear war. DEFCON 4 is one level above normal readiness. DEFCON 2 is when shit is hitting the fan and DEFCON 1 is when shit has coated the entire room and you are probably dead. So for the film to be called DEFCON 4 doesn't make much sense because approximately three minutes of the entire film takes place at DEFCON 4. So let's remove that from the cover. The next thing you'll notice is this absolutely badass spaceship laden with missiles. Yeah, this doesn't appear in the movie either. The ship that does is actually pretty cool, being a nice looking practical model that appears fairly heavily in the opening minutes of the film and sets the stage for the very competently done practical effects we get throughout. I suspect the vast majority of this film's budget went on those interior sets for these spaceship scenes. Personally, I think these sets look awesome. Having that same retro futurism that films like Alien popularised and that I've on more than one occasion professed my utter love for. I'm an absolute sucker for backhoe-foil wrap tubes, CRTVs and physical switches the cast can flip and fiddle with and it should come as no surprise that here is no different. With this opening in space being by far my favourite part of the film. Because yes, this film opens very strongly, setting the world and our protagonists up, showing that the US has a secret manned military satellite that has nukes on it. How being on this satellite for months, even years on end, has affected our protagonists and their loved ones, and sets up the fact the world isn't quite at DEFCON 4. In fact, it's very quickly at DEFCON 2 and then 1. We just skip DEFCON 3. It's a really effective Act 1, but subtly, in the form of news broadcasts, dialogue between the three crew members, and personal video blogs from family members, all helped by a very kick-ass sim-style soundtrack, sets up the tension the crew are feeling, and the world we're about to be flung into. Because, after the world has gone to hell in a handbasket, a nuclear war has broken out and destroyed humanity, killing everyone the crew cares about, the ship malfunctions and starts crash landing back on Earth. Which is again, a very nice practical model and effect. But before we cover the rest of the plot, we have to return to the poster. Let's remove the sexy badass ship and move on down to the next thing that takes our eye. Like this skeletal astronaut, would you be surprised if I told you he doesn't appear at all in this? Uh, because of course he doesn't. Nothing on this poster is in this. Because what we get is our three astronauts crash landing into a beach in Nova Scotia, Canada. Jordan, the only female and the doctor in the crew is knocked unconscious during the landing. Walker, the ship's commander, is ripped to pieces by terminals attempting to leave the ship 
Terminals being humans crazed by a mutated disease that has gripped Earth since the nuclear war ended, leaving Howe the only one able to physically leave the ship safely, which he does, and he of course instantly gets captured by Vinny, a survivalist who has fortified his house with booby traps and barbed wire. Now all Vinny is initially interested in is the food, giving Howe the rather hilarious option of giving him the food then dying or just dying straight away. Vinny is also keeping a sex slave under his floorboards. Keep that in mind because in 10 minutes, Vinny is about to become a protagonist and the way we find out he has a sex slave is unintentionally hilarious. This movie is full of these little bits where you'll sit and think to yourself, did that actually just happen? While softly shuffling to yourself, the sex slave, it turns out, can leave whenever she wants because she has her own trapdoor she uses to come and steal food when Vinny isn't watching. She's also a high schooler. Again, this makes no sense, but not much of this second earthbound part of the movie does. This also completes our cast of protagonists. A decent family man, a doctor, a sex pest, and his teenage sex slave. One of these is not like the others. But getting back to the plot, she agrees to let Howe escape and Vinny returns just as they are leaving. Forgets all about the food and just wants to murder Howe until he finds out the other astronaut is a woman and comes out with the greatest, most baffling response I have ever heard to discovering the existence of a woman. What kind of aureolas does she have? Pink, brown or red? A question for the ages, and if you are wondering, they are red and pointy and no, we don't ever get to see them. Vinny's burning desire to see these areolas means he goes in his battle tractor to the beach and everyone gets caught by the film's antagonist. I'm just gonna throw this out there. He's such a shit antagonist, he doesn't even get mentioned in the film's Wikipedia synopsis. He's the kind of antagonist you'd get in an early 80s teen sex comedy, you know, the kind of small pond bully that those films always had. Except, here's, he's in the post-apocalypse and still dresses like he's at a preppy pep rally. There's no way anyone would follow him, never mind a bunch of militarily trained psychopaths. They get captured by him about 40 minutes in, and the rest of the 87 minute runtime consists of them trying to escape from the preppy comedy reject villain before time runs out. Because yeah, I should have probably mentioned this earlier, but a nuclear bomb will explode in exactly 60 hours. Hell, the villain is so ineptly dumb, he doesn't even check to make sure all the nukes have been fired from the nuclear platform he just dragged into his base, leading to this bit of unintentional comedy gold at the end. Wait, wait, wait. It should almost be empty. This film the logic clearly never met. Sorry, where was I? Oh yeah, this astronaut on the poster doesn't even appear, so let's get rid of him and what are we left with? This sand. It's the only thing on this box art that actually makes an appearance in this movie. Even the weird dark shadows in the background are in it. As you've probably guessed already, the plot starts strongly with the space scenes and then veers off into generic post-apocalypse tropes on Earth. Hell, we even get a fortified shantytown populated by Mad Max castoffs. It's almost like one person wrote the first 30 minutes or so and someone entirely different did the rest, but the director, Paul Donovan, is the only writer credited on this film. But you aren't watching these movies for the plot, you watch them for the world building and the vibes. Both things with this film, surprisingly, largely as in spades, and the stupidity of the dialogue of the characters and the plot adds to the entertainment value immeasurably for me if I'm being honest. It adds a layer of absolute unintentional comedy gold. They probably spent 80% of the budget on those models and sets in space, and they look pretty awesome as a result, but this does mean the rest of the film looks like it was filmed in the city dump and the cast got to wear whatever they could find lying around. The acting swings wildly between competent and not so competent, but again, 
If you're watching low-budget Canadian post-apocalypse films from the mid-80s, you aren't expecting Oscar-worthy acting. All in all, Defcon 4 isn't a great film if you are a normal human being who has taste. But if you are like me and an absolute sucker for retro-futurism, the post-apocalypse in all of its many flavours and silly but entertainingly so low-budget schlock plots, you'll love this flick. Thanks for watching, if you haven't already subscribed, please do so, leave a like, maybe even comment and I'll hopefully catch you in the next video.